All right, today we are going to cover respiratory motion and how medical physicists can deal with that unique issue when treatment planning and treating patients specifically, mainly with SBRTs and things of that nature. So say you are asked on your oral exam, what are the dosimetric impacts of not accounting for respiratory motion? What resources would you consider? How would you QA your motion management? How much could respiratory motion move organs? And what approximate errors are there if not taken into account? So what are those metric impacts here? So this, uh, there's a lot. So for example, complete target miss. That's obviously, that is the big one and the most scary. You also have dose blurring. So you, there are not steep gradients on the PTV. Ultimately, that dose is kind of blurred. That gives more dose to the critical organs surrounding the, the PTV. And ultimately, a lot of the PTV, there may be cold or hot spots. So you don't want that. There's also the interplay effect. Take a little deeper dive. Don't want to do that quite in this video, but essentially, if there are two different timelines of MLC motion and target movement, and they don't coincide like it was planned in the treatment planning system, again, you're going to get hot and cold spots and you may get some of that target miss. Uh, you may need large margins to accommodate this. So if you're not doing gating or some type of something in treatment planning or at the table to account for the motion, then you are going to need large margins. And that is going to mean more dose to critical organs and surrounding tissues. You also could get contouring errors and then contouring. There we go. And then the IMRT and wedge fields are the worst for respiratory motion because there's that interplay effect. And then just accounting for all of that movement. So what resource would you consider? TG76. And if you've watched many of my videos, you know I broke my first rule that if you know that there is a task group or a reference for this you know, specific thing that they are asking, mention it first and foremost and reference it often. I didn't do that here because I already asked for it. But note, many examiners Honestly, I didn't get asked a single time, what resource would you go to? You have to know it and you have to know to bring it up yourself. Now, if you don't know it, no big deal unless they ask it. But again, it shows a lot of extra initiative and knowledge to immediately know, oh, respiratory motion, TG76, mention it and reference it. So how would you QA your motion management? So Varian has a infrared box that you can use that. Essentially, it's a respiratory motion phantom. There's a quasar phantom that moves a target. The test, you want tests ultimately that the tracking is accurate, that it beams off when it is out of tolerance, and you at least need to do an annual end-to-end -end test from CT to treatment, and for that, you want to follow TG142. So look into it. TG76 obviously talks about it some too. Good reference materials, pretty basic stuff. Don't go too far into the weeds. Just mention, just like what I said, you know what to do, and then you just don't have much time to jump into it. So how much could respiratory motion move organs? So as much as 5 cm, believe it or not, an absolute ton, but most of the time it is about 1 cm. And if obviously the tumor is closer to the diaphragm, that means there's more movement. So that's where you're going to get bigger numbers like this 5 cm. Now, what would be really good is, for example, in my clinic, we say if the movement is less than 1 cm, uh, we don't really worry about it. If it's 1 cm, we consider using gating. And then if it's greater than 1 cm, we heavily 
kind of convince the physician, hey, you really need to consider using gating for this case, being able to mention that type of experience in your clinic during the exam is a huge plus. It's going to give you that bonus points that are going to help you get the maximum points on this question rather than just passing through. And it's something it's about your clinic. You feel comfortable doing and it shows you have experience with it. Big time brownie points. Anytime you can put some of that in any of these questions, please do. That is going to set you up for the best success possible. So now finally, what approximate errors are there if it's not taken into account? So for a single fraction, so obviously this is going to differ. There are a lot of variables here, but it could be up to 20% for a single fraction, which is nuts. Now for a 30 fraction, normal course, you know, that's going to end up equating into one to 2% error. So obviously this is a huge concern for SBRTs where you only have five fractions. Well, you know, there's a little mix, but even if it's 10%, that could be 50, you know, five gray that is not accounted for or that is aired. It, big deal for SBRTs. Obviously, more fractions you have, a little less worrisome, but knowing what approximate errors are important and will show that you have the clinical knowledge and understand how big these errors can be in certain situations. So if you have any questions about respiratory motion, please comment below. I'll answer and help in any way I can. Until then, thanks for watching and happy studying.